His covenant with Abraham, he promised him salvation, and then he charged him to walk before him blamelessly. And later to the Israelites, the Lord specified what that is all about, how to walk with God blamelessly. Salvation comes first. Our response of walking with him blamelessly comes afterward. And the Ten Commandments summarize what God means by a blameless walk of life. And so we read them this Sunday, as we do every Lord's Day, to remind ourselves of His will for our lives. Let's hear God's law then from Deuteronomy 5. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So that's His fulfillment of His promise to save. And now that we are saved, and you have to think of salvation in Jesus Christ, He gives us His commands. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, your ox or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest, as well as you. You shall remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long, that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So this is the way of blameless living. This is the way God wants us to be thankful to him. Can we keep this way perfectly? And every day we have to say and confess, no, we cannot. Every Sunday we do that collectively as church. We cannot keep 
these commands perfectly, though we are trying, and the Holy Spirit lives in us to produce in obedience and good works increasingly, and yet even our best works have a taint of sin in them. As Isaiah says, all we, all we like sheep have gone astray. There is no one who does good. So let's sing about what the Lord has done for us to relieve us of the, all our sins and guilt. He had to put his own son to death. We sing about that in Psalm 89, stanzas 14 and 15. So 89, we started the service with that. Words of praise at the beginning, but it turns to a lament because God turned over his king, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He turned him over to the enemy to ultimately be put to death for our sins. So let's sing stanzas 14 and 15 and think of the Lord Jesus as you sing those words. Isaiah 1, there are these words, first the words of accusation. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. By nature, that's where we're all at. We don't know God and we would turn away from him in our sinfulness. But then comes this word of grace and assurance. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And that promise is ultimately fulfilled for us in the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life on the cross to pay for all our sins. Let us come to God in prayer, asking also for a blessing over the worship service. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for the great promise we could just hear that though our sins are like scarlet and we admit that they are, yet you make us as white as snow. You do that in the blood of your precious Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so we exalt you and praise your holy name. You are our great Savior. You have offered up your only begotten Son out of your grace. We didn't deserve that. We don't deserve your ongoing love and care. But you grant it to us nevertheless, simply because you are a God of love, a God of kindness, a God of generosity, a God who in the beginning created this world out of nothing and made man on this earth so that you might give yourself in communion, in fellowship to your creature, mankind. We thank you, Father, that in Christ you are restoring that fellowship that we might be reconciled to you and so be welcomed again in your presence. How good you are to us. On this, at this time of the year, <clears throat> with Thanksgiving Day tomorrow, in our, uh, in our country, in our society, we have the more reason to thank you. Not only have you created us, not only have you saved us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but you also shower upon us many daily blessings. We have jobs. We have health. We have cupboards full of food. We have shelter over our heads. We have friends and family. We have the family of God here in this church. We are able to gather freely every Lord's Day. And we know, Lord, there are many places in this world where these things are not so, where Christians cannot gather freely, where people generally have hardly enough to eat, if at all, where there is much poverty and heartbreak and sorrow. We have our struggles. And certainly we have our sorrows, but we also today, Lord, acknowledge the many, many blessings we have from your hand here in this country of ours. We also thank you for the crops that are being gathered in at this time of the year and have yet to be gathered. Those crops look bountiful. We thank you for the bounty you have given here in our province and across our country and really across the world. We thank you that there is food growing or has been growing this past season in the fields and on the trees and that's been able to feed so very many people around the world. All of it is from your hand and we want to give you the thanks. Lord God, thank you for the many, many blessings we have from your hand. May we use them in your service. May we use them generously to build up your kingdom May we think of the poor and the needy. May we think of the many kingdom causes, endeavors, organizations, works, and projects that are underway near us or elsewhere that are trying to glorify your name, that are trying to raise up a banner for your kingdom in this world. Lord, bless those efforts, and may we be part of that kingdom-building work by giving generously as you have first given generously to us. Lord, we pray that you would bless our worship this morning as we will soon open your word together and listen to the preaching. Grant to us ears to hear. Your words are life. Grant that they would work life in all of our hearts, that you would plant faith if there isn't yet faith there. And where there is faith in the many hearts gathered here, then we pray that you would strengthen it and develop it and grow it so that we might have stronger trust, greater assurance, and a more devoted life lived for your honor and glory. All this we ask of you, Father, and praying too for a blessing in the preaching that your servant may speak what is true and right and bring honor to you and serve the upbuilding of your church. It all depends on you, on your blessing, on your spirit. This we ask in Christ alone. Amen. In light of Thanksgiving Day tomorrow, I'd like to read a few verses from Deuteronomy, and then we're going to sing from hymn 76. Just a small reflection on 
the physical blessings the Lord provides, they do come from His hand. So I'd like to read from Deuteronomy 24. Starting at verse 17. There's two things to pick up from this passage. One, that all physical blessings do come from God. Two, that He expects us to do something with those blessings. And He highlights here that we have a responsibility to care for those who have less than we do. Starting at verse 17. You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless, or take a widow's garment in pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. So, the Lord is telling us that He grants us the blessings of field, of, of food, of our daily labor. He grants us more than we need. And when we have more than we need, we are to leave some, we are to give some for those who do not have the blessings we have. He mentions the fatherless, so that's the, the orphans. He mentions the widows, who in that society particularly were poor and vulnerable. And the sojourner, so those would be people that were living in their midst but had no rights to land. They often also were uh, poor. So brothers and sisters, as we count our blessings this uh, Thanksgiving, as we think of all the Lord has blessed us with, and as we will gather a, a Thanksgiving blessing or a Thanksgiving offering after the, the sermon, uh, let us remember to be generous. Let us remember to be kind. Let us remember to give in accordance with the blessings the Lord has given to us. Now let's praise and thank our God with the words of hymn 76, stanzas 1 and 2. invite you to turn with me in Scripture to the Gospel of John. We'll be continuing our sermon series from that Gospel. Today we focus on the last part of chapter 6, but in the reading I'd like to read a few verses from chapter 3 where 
the Lord Jesus, in his discussion with Nicodemus, goes over some similar themes that crop up again at the end of chapter 6. So some, some of the thoughts from chapter 3 can help us understand chapter 6. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That's as far as a scripture reading will go. Let's sing in preparation for the preaching Psalm 16, the stanzas 1, 4, and 5, where there's reference to the Holy One, and ultimately the Holy One of God that refers to the anointed Lord Jesus Christ. That thought comes back in John 6 as well. So let's sing stanzas 1, 4, and 5 of Psalm 16.
Please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. We've worked our way through this lengthy chapter. We've seen that there's been this controversy between the crowd of Jews in Capernaum, between them and the Lord Jesus. And then there's kind of an aftermath to this dispute, a fallout, I guess you could say, starting at verse 60, and that'll be the focus of the preaching this morning. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. That's the conclusion of our text and the focus of the preaching this morning. In response to the preaching, we'll sing from Psalm 73, the stanzas 8 and 9. Church of the living God. Just how offensive is the gospel? As we as congregation get more involved in speaking with our neighbors and reaching out to the community with the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ, we are all, I'm sure, trying our best not to be offensive in the way we come across. We try not to be rude, but respectful. We try not to antagonize people with unnecessarily harsh statements, but focus on the positive message of forgiveness and salvation. We try hard to be winsome, not abrasive. Our goal is to win our neighbor for Christ, a laudable goal, And part of doing that is not giving offense. And yet what happens when people are offended by the very message of the gospel itself? Do we realize how the work of Jesus Christ, how the the salvation that he brings, is for some people a pill too bitter to swallow? Something that they cannot accept. And when we run into a person, encounter a person who's offended not by our manner, but by the very words, the gospel that we bring, how then should we respond? These are the issues and questions of our text as the crowds of Jews respond to Jesus' preaching. Jesus uses this occasion to teach the 12 disciples and us today how to handle the offense of the gospel. And so I bring you this word of the Lord under this theme, only Jesus' words give eternal life. Only Jesus' words give eternal life. We'll take a look at the mystifying rejection and then the miraculous 
acceptance. Well, so far in this encounter, all the way through chapter 6, this encounter with the crowds, we've seen an increasingly negative response from them. There's already been a fair amount of rejection. We've seen that over the previous sermons, but in our text, it, it goes up a level, up a notch. For John writes in verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it. They said, this is a hard saying, who can accept it? So it's not just the broad crowd of Jews having issues with Jesus, but now all of a sudden it's many of his disciples. It gets repeated in verse 61, but Jesus knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling. There's dissension in the ranks. You know, it's one thing when passing strangers dislike your message and turn away. That's one thing. It's quite another when your very familiar students, your disciples, take offense and also think about turning away. That's a whole different ballgame. Well, who are these disciples anyway? From later in the text, we know it's a group that's larger than the twelve because it's the twelve who stick around. From the other Gospels, we know that there was, at least early on in Jesus' ministry, there was a larger group of followers who were attracted to Jesus' teaching, who believed His words, who had committed themselves to Christ. That's what a disciple is. It literally means a student. A student then who's dedicated to learning from the teacher or the master. So like the twelve, they would very literally walk around with him. Later in the text it says they no longer walked with Jesus. So for a time they quite literally walked the countryside with Jesus. And you can think of uh, the 70 disciples. On another occasion, the Lord Jesus sent out 70 men in pairs to preach the gospel and to announce his arrival ahead of him as he was making his tour through the various villages. So at one time, there was a fairly large body of disciples surrounding Jesus whom Jesus had spent time with, had eaten meals with, had conversed with, in other words, they knew Jesus and he knew them personally. And yet, despite all that they had seen and heard from Christ, something he just said had evidently caught them sideways and makes them doubt. That gets referred to in verse 60, this hard saying. Well, that would naturally refer to the Last thing Jesus said in the previous verses, and I think verse 58 kind of summarizes this hard saying, verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread, said Jesus, will live forever. So these disciples, they're not offended by Jesus' style or his manner, but at his words. And verse 61 says that they began to grumble. The disciples started to grumble. Well, that's the same as what the crowds were doing earlier. John mentions that in verse 41 and 43. Everybody around them was grumbling. Now the disciples start to grumble too. And that word grumble should ring a few bells because that grumbling was something the fathers of old used to do in Moses' day. And not a good thing. The Israelites under Moses in the wilderness, they, they, they grumbled when there was no water. They grumbled when life was hard. They grumbled when they were told to go into Canaan and, and, and God would crush the giants in front of them, but they didn't believe, so they grumbled. You have to understand this grumbling is not just a, a bit of minor discontent. This is unbelief, grumbling in the desert was unbelief, grumbling out of the mouths of these disciples around Jesus is also unbelief. John tells us, verse 66, 
After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They went into unbelief. They could not accept Jesus' words. Can you accept Jesus' words, beloved? It's not passing strangers who grumble, but it's people like us, people who know, people who have professed faith of a kind anyway, people who made a commitment, people who identify as believers, they took offense. Do you take offense? Do I? What were they offended by? Well, there seems to be two things that tripped up these disciples. One, that Jesus dared to claim that he had come down from heaven with the implication that he is son of God, and also he calls himself son of man, and that's a reference to the figure that Daniel the prophet saw in his vision, that son of man who uh, went to meet Yahweh on the clouds, so that's also a, a divine name. Jesus says, that's me. They had a problem with that. The second reason is that Jesus, as Son of Man, had said to them that he would bring salvation by sacrificing his flesh on their behalf, by dying for them. That was the bread from heaven. We've seen that in previous sermons. That was the food for their souls which would endure to eternal life, which they needed to accept and eat by faith. But these disciples, they couldn't stomach it. And as we saw last time, their expectation, their vision of what the Messiah would be and what kind of salvation he would bring was completely different from what Jesus was now telling them. They weren't thinking sacrificial lamb. They were thinking conquering hero. And so they're offended. And Jesus turns and asks them, do you take offense at this? He doesn't pull back. Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Jesus never changes his message to win hearers. He actually pushes back on their unbelief. You don't think I came from heaven? You take offense that I said I came down from heaven? then what will you think on the day when you see me, the Son of Man, because that's who I am, when you see me with your own eyes back in heaven, ascended in glory, what will you say then? You find it offensive, he says to them, that, that I have to give my flesh in sacrifice for you? then how stunned will you be when you see the Son of Man having been crucified, now raised to life and raised up to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father in glory and power and splendor? What will you say then? Because that's going to happen. All that I have said to you is true. And though it means hardship and suffering and pain and torture for me in the short term, term, it will mean glory and honor for me, and it will mean for you salvation and rescue from sin and Satan and death in the long term. So don't take offense at my words, but believe my words. Jesus never changes his message to win hearers, but the hearers have to be changed to accept his message. His words are the only words which have the power to give eternal life. You never dumb down the gospel to win converts, but you rely on Christ's Spirit to convert the very people given to Christ by the Father. Conversion of hearers, the forging of true disciples who will last who accept and believe all that Christ teaches, that is the work of Christ through His Spirit. J. 
Jesus said it to Nicodemus already in those verses we read, chapter 3. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You have to be born of the Spirit. You can't make yourself born of the Spirit. He said that earlier in chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now he says it in verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life flesh is no help at all what he means by the flesh in this context is humanity in general human ability in general human decision making power that's no help at all he says it's the spirit it's got to do it the spirit of god the spirit whom the ascended christ will later send down to earth in full force to live in the church and the words of Jesus work together with the Spirit of Jesus to produce life. Spiritual life inside the hearers who are dead spiritually. Hearers that are selected or chosen by the Father and given to the Son. As he said earlier in the chapter. The flesh is no help at all, says Jesus. That is what explains the mystifying rejection of these disciples by people who had once made a commitment to follow him. It's mystifying because from our standpoint, we're thinking, how can they do that? How can they leave? These disciples they received an opportunity, think about this, to walk with Jesus in the flesh. They could go out down the street, walking beside him, talking with the Lord Jesus Christ face to face, hear him teach. Like just, just imagine being, a, you know, hearing the Sermon on the Mount in person. See him organize that miraculous catch of fish in person. See him heal the sick, cast out demons with your own eyes. That's what these people had seen and heard. We're kind of bewildered at their response, aren't we? I mean, don't you just wish you could have been there with Jesus for just a single day? Wouldn't that have been amazing? Don't you feel like saying to this, these disciples, how could you be so blind as to not see Jesus for who He is? You were there with Him in person. You, you saw those miracles. How could you fail to embrace Him as your Messiah, and Savior, and Lord? We can become frustrated with the crowds and their unbelief. It, it confounds us. It bamboozles us. It perplexes us. But brothers and sisters, we need to hear also these words of Jesus. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. You and I didn't come to faith in Jesus because we're just a little bit smarter than the next guy. Just a little bit smarter than those disciples who walked the shores of Galilee with him. Because we are maybe a little bit more perceptive, a little more humble, a little more godly or have a little bit more free will in our veins than they did. No. All flesh would fail to respond as they did if it were not for Christ and His Spirit. All humans, including ourselves, would turn away from Jesus if it were not for the power of His Spirit and words which, which enter into our stony hearts and make those hearts soft and pliable and believing hearts. Well, there's at least two things to take away from that particular teaching. First, don't be so shocked and don't be disheartened when people turn away from Jesus, even people you know. 
This happened very personally to the Son of God himself. Disciples turned away. No amount of preaching, no amount of miracles by or fellowship with the Savior himself could make them believe. And so it is still to this day. You and I can't give people faith. We can't change their hearts. And so unbelief, it divides, divides communities. It Unbelief splits off members from the church as they go their own way. It separates friends. Unbelief breaks apart families. That, that antithesis between belief and unbelief, it, it r- runs right down your turkey table this Thanksgiving. At least it could in many cases. Believer and unbeliever around the same dining room And though the unbelief you see across from you at that table, it grieves you and it pains you as it most certainly grieves and pains the Son and the Father, make no mistake. Though you have that pain, do not let it rattle you as something unexpected. Do not let it undermine your own faith Do not think of joining them in their unbelief because it has always been this way. A turning away from the words of Jesus, a turning away from Jesus himself has always cut through families and friends and churches and synagogues and communities. So hang on to your faith by hanging on to the Lord Jesus and his words with all your heart. Don't let the unbelief set you off. And then, brothers and sisters, pray with all your heart. That's the second thing to take away here. Jesus repeats in verse 65 an earlier point. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. We have to take that seriously. It's the Father in charge. It's the Father who directs hearts, who draws people in through the words and spirit of His Son, Jesus Christ. So pray to the Father for the conversion of the hearts you are concerned about. Hearts that are currently turned away from Christ. Don't don't look to the people themselves to change their own hearts because they cannot. But your Father in heaven can. He can send forth His irresistible, His invincible grace. And we know that the Father is good. He's filled with grace, filled with love, filled with kindness. We know He longs to save the the lost. Just like the Father in the parable of the prodigal son, that Father was ready every single day. He was eagerly ready every day to receive back His prodigal child so our Heavenly Father is eager to receive repentant sinners still today. That's His posture. So pray. Pray for your parents and your grandparents, your sons and your daughters, your cousin or your friend, your neighbor or co-worker, whether they've once been a disciple or never have yet confessed Christ, whether they are a straying covenant sheep or have never been inside the flock, appeal to the Father's unfathomable mercy to work in their hearts an acceptance of the gospel. He's the source of all that. Of course you speak to your loved one, your contact, your friend, when you have the chance. But before doing so, and even during, you know those little silent prayers? in your mind while you're speaking and then after you speak before during after pray be unceasing in prayer for that individual or those people because the way to win your neighbor's heart is by pleading with your father in heaven who most certainly will grant miraculous acceptance to all whom he has chosen for the Lord Jesus we should take note, is not disheartened by this development. 
Imagine you were the teacher. First, there were, you know, there was 15,000 people around him at the beginning of chapter 6, and all were singing his praises, right? Everybody wanted him to become king. By the end of chapter 6, those 15,000 had dissipated. They didn't want to hear from him anymore. And now the disciples who had been with him for quite a while, let's say a group of 100, let's just throw that number out there, most of them are taken off too. That wouldn't make you feel very good, would it, if you were the teacher? But the Lord Jesus is not put off by this. Notice how he responds, verse 64. There are some of you who do not believe. And then John, the writer, adds a comment for our benefit. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. He knew it all along. <clears throat> He's not surprised. On the one hand, when the crowd of disciples was swelling and even that larger crowd of people were coming, he did not chase them away. He didn't say to them, oh, you're a bunch of fakers, go take off. I don't want to deal with you. I know you're going to disappoint me later on anyway. No, no, he patiently taught them. And with those disciples, he walked with them, he welcomed them. But on the other hand, when they left, he was not taken aback. And he was not taken aback either at those who stayed. In the midst of this large departure of disciples and the crowds, there were some who stayed. With all that negative hubbub going around, you would wonder if anybody would stay. He turns and he asks the twelve, verse 67, do you want to go away as well? And actually, in the original, it's, it's a rhetorical question that expects a negative answer. So a better translation would be this. You do not want to leave too, do you? The question expects a negative answer. Jesus expects. Jesus knows they're going to say, of course not. The answer is not in doubt because Jesus knows those who believe. He knows those whom the Father has given him. And he knows they will stay. And led by Peter, the twelve do not disappoint. Peter responds, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. To whom shall we go? Lord, where else could we possibly go? Who else has the words of eternal life? That's what Peter is saying. Plato and Aristotle don't have them. Philosophers known to the disciples. The Egyptians and their band of gods don't have life to give. The Babylonians and the Assyrians, once powerful emperor, empires, have come and gone. Even the Romans and their their high imperial emperor of the day have all kinds of military power, but they don't have the power to overcome death. Not a single Roman has come back to life. And not a single Roman can give eternal life. Lord, only you've got that power. That's what Peter is saying. Is that also then your confession, brothers and sisters? Do you look around the world today at all the options there are? All the possibilities that are presented and say there's, there's nothing there. Philosophers have not solved the problem of death. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, Great Spiritism, they all promise paradise but none can deliver. Atheism, that's a non-starter because all it promises is death once you die. Human science, human reason, and logic proclaim that they can set out to solve all of humanity's problems, but in 6,000 years of trying, has the world become better? Isn't the world in darkness? We've got Hamas sending rockets over to Israel. 
killing innocent people and vice versa. We've got wars all over the world. We've got Putin invading Ukraine for no reason. Man isn't going to solve man's problem. The only one who has the words of eternal life, the words which produce life, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, we're not going anywhere. Where would we go? Only you can solve these problems. Notice the emphasis on the words of Jesus. He said in verse 63, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Peter picks up on that in verse 68. You have the words of eternal life. Words. Words that come from Christ have power. The words of the Holy One, as he's called, the anointed one, the appointed Messiah sent by the Father. His words, they have a power in them. Just like in the beginning, go back to Genesis 1 in your mind, when God spoke a world, a word, what happened? A world popped into existence out of nothing. God's word creates. God's word alone makes something where before there was nothing. That's what the words of Jesus do. For he is God alongside of the Father and of the Spirit too. When he speaks with the intention to create faith and generate spiritual life in somebody, then his Spirit empowers those words to do exactly that. Sparking faith, sparking life in hearts where there had been no faith and no life. His words are life-giving. That's why we, we need, as, as believers, to, to continually stick closely to the words of Christ as found in the Bible. The Word of God, as proclaimed by His servants from the pulpits, but also as passed on in conversation, as meditated on in our Bible studies, the words of God, the words of the Savior, they bring about miracles the miracle of initial faith in stony hearts and the miracle of a spiritual communion with God and that ongoing miracle of strengthening faith and intensifying, developing, and maturing communion with God. When you read the Bible, when you hear its message explained and applied, then divine power is at work to bless God's people. So what do you and I need to do, brothers and sisters? Well, pretty simple. Immerse ourselves in the Word. Don't miss it. Don't miss your morning devotions. Better to skip breakfast than to miss your devotions. Miss your time with the life-giving power of the Word and prayer. Don't miss Bible study. Don't miss Sunday preaching, for eternal life is being created and nurtured by the Spirit of your Savior in these things. Coming to accept the words of Christ is indeed a miracle. It's the work of the triune God in us. Not something we could ever take credit for. That's humbling, but it's also deeply comforting. For this same Almighty God, with His invincible grace, He will never stop His work in you and in me. However weak we might feel, however close to the edge we might come, sometimes our questions and our doubts mount up Sometimes we feel like our feet are slipping away from beneath us, but the Father's work of drawing His elect, His chosen ones, through the words and the Spirit of the Son, His work will go on even if there is betrayal of the worst kind. Jesus makes a reference to that 
In answering Peter's confession, he says, verse 70, did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? What would you think if you were one of the twelve hearing that? One of you is a devil. Why did he say that? Why would Jesus tell them that at this time? Well, he's getting them ready. He's getting them ready for the unthinkable act of Judas Iscariot's treachery, handing Jesus over to be murdered. He wants them to be ready so that when it does happen, their faith won't be shattered. That most diabolical act, that satanic betrayal, it has to happen in accordance with the Father's will, but don't let it ruin your trust in me. It's all part of the plan. Those 11 on the night of betrayal, they would be sifted. And Peter himself would have his faith tested to the uttermost. He would even deny knowing Jesus three times. But unlike Judas, the words of Jesus would remain in their hearts, all 11. And through tears of repentance, especially on Peter's part, the seed of faith would be revived and it would grow again and it would it would embrace the Lord Jesus again and become a mighty force that faith within the hearts and lives of Peter and the eleven, uh, Peter and the ten. The Father hangs on to his elect. You can't, you can't undo that. So where will you go, my brothers, my sisters? Where will you go if not to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Holy One of God who alone has the words of life. Believe in Him. Know this to be true in your hearts and, and give thanks to Him. Not just this time of the year, Thanksgiving time. Not just over turkey dinner but give thanks at every dinner, at every occasion, on every day for the life, the eternal life you have received from Christ. And then pray for that life to be created in the hearts of those where it does not yet exist. Amen. Let's sing together Psalm 73, 8 and 9, and let's do that standing.
Let's join together in thanksgiving prayer. Lord God Almighty, thank you for revealing to us our powerlessness and your invincible power. Of ourselves, we would not come to you. We could not embrace you. We don't want to by nature. But thank you, Father, for breaking through our hard hearts to work faith in there by the power of Christ's words and spirit. Invincible grace, we've experienced it, the miracle of coming to faith, the miracle of communion with Almighty God. The thought is breathtaking. The reality is, it's wonderful. Teach us, O Lord, to experience the wonder of communion with you more and more that the relationship we have with you is, is not just a technical thing or a, some kind of paper bond, but that it is a living bond where there is a spiritual connection between yourself and us through your spirit. May we all embrace that and look to grow in that. And then may all of us out of that live a life of thankfulness more and more. Lord, we, we pray for those people around us, people we know, maybe in our own families, who at this moment have not embraced the gospel or maybe even have turned away from it. It's a heartache in many instances. And maybe Thanksgiving is going to be that much harder in some of our dining rooms. Where that's the case, give extra grace. Give us wisdom to know what to say and when to say it. But most of all, Lord, give us hope. Hope in you. You are the changer of hearts. We don't know who is elect and who is unelect. We do know. You are the God of all grace and love. You do not desire the death of the wicked. You have come after us, and so we have no reason to think you, you would not also go after them. Lord, go after them. Work in their hearts. Change them. Convert them. Bring them to yourself so that we may rejoice together in the salvation of we all experience, whether it's in the family circle or the, the friend circle or at work or with a, a neighbor, Lord, do this for the glory of your name and the upbuilding of your church. We want to thank you this day, Lord, for your grace uh, in, in all our lives in so many different ways. We thank you that you are with us in our challenges. We pray that you would be with our brother Nathan DeYoung and his wife Tanya, that they would continue to experience your nearness as our, our brother deals with certain challenges that necessitated him laying down his office of elder. We thank you for his service as elder in the time that he was able to do so and pray for respite and rest that he would be given what he needs, he and his wife and family, and that perhaps in due time, with your blessing, our brother may be in a position again to serve. Grant him your grace. And as we look for a new elder, as we seek nominations from the congregation, we pray for your blessing. We know and trust that this whole process is under your guidance. Grant that names may come forward that are suitable as you described in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, and that eventually we can select a brother and appoint a brother to serve, and that this brother would then be chosen by you through the congregation. 
we lay before you the needs of the Ben Bostelin family. We thank you that they have the, the promises of the gospel for the, the death of Sister Hannah Lenkake. Lord, it's been a difficult year for our sister Sonia Ben Bostelin and her husband Peter, having lost siblings to death within this calendar year, and now another. Lord, that's heavy for them. We thank you that they do put their trust in you. We pray that the riches of the gospel and the words of eternal life may fill their hearts and produce ongoing consolation and that they would be content with the way you have guided and providentially organized their lives. We thank you that they can be with us celebrating Thanksgiving with Wade and Leanne. So we pray too for that comfort to extend to Wade and Leanne and Adrian and Carrie, uh, a niece of Sister Lenkake. Lord, may all who are mourning, all who are hurt by the, the death of their loved one, may they be comforted in the gospel. We pray for the Christian gleaners for whom we will shortly give our Christian offerings. Thank you, Lord, for the work that the gleaners do in using up uh, excess food so that it doesn't go to waste but can be given to the needy and other places. Lord, bless this organization. May they receive the financial needs, but also the volunteers that are required to keep the, the chopping and the packaging and the sorting of vegetables and whatever else they do so that others in the world can receive it and be fed by it. We thank you for this work of charity. Father, bless us as we uh, carry on with our worship service and hope to gather once again later this day to bring you praise. May all our hearts be filled with the wonder of your love, and may our fellowship together be upbuilding and strengthening. This we ask in Christ Jesus alone. Amen. You may bring your thank offering to the Lord at this time. As mentioned, the offering is for the Christian gleaners. And after the offering has been gathered, we will rise and sing hymn 76, stanzas 3 and 4.
receive the blessing of the Lord and go in his peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.